who needs what specific B vitamin? If you were to go on Google and do a simple search for the benefits of specific B vitamins, you would get a very vague, simple reason to take X B vitamin. What I wanna do is reverse engineer that. What do the deficiencies look like? Who needs what specific B vitamin? Now, with that, we can start getting more granular. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Now, after this video, I put a link down below for 20% off of Sun Warrior. Sun Warrior has some awesome protein powders. They have one that's called their Active Line, which is super unique. It's a blend of pumpkin seed protein and pea protein, but they also have probiotics added. it. They have enzymes so that you're aiding in the protein digestion, and they have other minerals and things like that added into it, so it really becomes more of a complete food. So whether you're someone that's plant-based or not, it's a protein powder that I highly recommend adding in. So what I personally do is I rotate out. I have whey protein a fair bit, but I tend to alternate my whey protein and my plant-based protein. The problem with a lot of plant-based proteins is they really lack what you need to have the abundant amino acid profile to actually be a complete protein. And even still, it's harder to digest. But the cool thing is, one serving of the active line protein also has four grams of fiber in it. So you're getting a good full spectrum shake that's helping your gut out as well. I definitely recommend it. And that link gets you 20% off anything at their website. So it's not just going to be the protein powders. They have B vitamins, they have multivitamins, they have green strings, they have all kinds of stuff. So that link is down below, top line in the description. Make sure you use that link and that code to save 20% off. Vitamin B1. Vitamin B1 is going to be best for people that need help digesting and metabolizing carbohydrates. If you find that when you eat carbs, your blood sugar spikes high, this is where this comes in handy. So there's a study published in Journal of Animal Physiology, it was a rodent model study, looked at B1 deficient diets. So they put mice on a def deficient diet. They found that with this, it decreased their glucose uptake. So when they were giving them less vitamin B1, they were able to suck up less glucose. Therefore, their glucose was higher. The reason that it does this is it suppresses ATP synthesis. And when this happens, you're basically losing out on the energy that is required for metabolism. So if B1 is not in your system as much as it should be, you don't oxidize carbohydrates as well. So you don't you literally don't use them as, as well for fuel. Therefore, they pile up in your system a lot more. So very important there. That's one that's totally okay to get from things like uh, poultry, like turkey, really rich in thiamine there. Also, a simple B vitamin's good. Vitamin B2, also known as riboflavin. This is going to be specifically good for a couple cases. One, if you're pregnant, absolutely. It is critically involved in like bone, muscle, and nerve building. So without it, you're gonna run into an issue. That's why it's so important in a lot of prenatal vitamins. But also, it helps you take proteins and fats and turn them into appropriate tissues and cells. So it's like the intermediary energy metabolism, not just from carbs, but from proteins and fats, turning it A into energy or B into cellular function. So it's very, very important as a, as a sort of intermediary. Vitamin B3, super underrated. Okay, so also known commonly as like niacin, niacinamide. So this you can produce internally, endogenously from tryptophan. So a lot of times people say, oh, it's not important, you don't need B3. It is a ruthlessly inefficient process building it from your own tryptophan stores. So I do recommend if you're someone that is trying to uh, actually like have an antioxidant effect, especially if you're focused on your skin, I do recommend taking it directly. So it works directly as an antioxidant. It's the only B vitamin that is a direct antioxidant in and of itself. Even in a topical setting, there are studies that demonstrate that it can improve dermatitis and like rosacea. And if it's, if it's ingested, it becomes much more anti-inflammatory than just when it's topical. So when it's ingested, it has anti-inflammatory actions as well. And there are a lot of studies that show that B3 is really good for acne, which is interesting because a lot of times you see that B5 is what they say, pantothenic acid to use for acne, when in reality, when ingested, B3 might actually be better for various forms of acne, which is so ironic because most Google searches will point you to B5. Speaking of vitamin B5, also known as pantothenic acid, yes, it's good for the skin. If you take it in high doses, your skin will get really dry. Uh, tremendous for fat metabolism. Now, this is fat metabolism, not just from the diet, but also from your own stored fat. What it does, is it helps produce what's called coenzyme A, which is critical for the breakdown of fatty acids. There's a study in nutrition, I found this interesting. They took a look at B5 deficient rats, so rats that did not have enough vitamin B5. 
And they did this for 30 days where they put them on a B5 deficient diet. And then they had them go 13 days of refeeding at normal calories along with vitamin B5 or without vitamin B5. The vitamin B5 deficient refeed diet, those rats ended up gaining more fat even when calories were matched, which was interesting. So without vitamin B5, they gained more fat. And part of the reason that this is speculated to happen is A, the metabolism, like the cofactor A or the coenzyme A, but also there was a study that found that it triggered the expression of uncoupling protein one, which means it's actually making it so that you're burning more fat as heat or energy as heat from the mitochondrial inefficiency process. So hugely important if weight loss is your goal. Now, as far as vitamin B5 is concerned, Yes, you can take it in supplement form, but if you start taking it too high, it's gonna dry out your skin. So what I might recommend is uh, beef, chicken, mushrooms, avocado, and liver are tremendous sources of vitamin B5 if you wanna to try to get it from your diet. Now let's move over to vitamin B6. So vitamin B6, very wicked cool for eyesight. Again, not a common theme that you'd see if you were to do a Google search, but if you start looking at the deficiencies, you can work backwards and realize what it's really good for. So if you're having issues with your eyes, the Archives of Internal Medicine published this paper with over uh, 5,400 people, and they were looking at people that had cardiovascular disease risk with three or more risk factors. And with this, they were also looking at advanced macular degeneration, so their eyes deteriorating. Vitamin B6 reduced the risk of advanced macular degeneration over 7.3 years. So they looked at it over a long time. People that were essentially metabolically unhealthy and had cardiac disease, cardiac disease risk, over seven years, if they took vitamin B6, they had less chance of having messed up vision and macular degeneration. Why? It's likely because vitamin B6 helps break down homocysteine. When homocysteine builds up, it triggers oxidative stress and particularly can damage the vessels and the small vessels around the eyes. So that oxidative stress really can wear down the uh, various components of the eyes and the body in general, even the brain, but in this particular case, the vessels around the eyes. Vitamin B7, probably my favorite secret B vitamin. And the reason that it's my favorite is because when you think about biotin, vitamin B7, what's the first thing that comes to mind? hair, skin, and nails. Oh, take this biotin treatment for your hair. Like, because there are some studies that definitely back that up. Don't get me wrong, it's legit. But one of the biggest reasons you should be considering it is for high blood sugar and for carb metabolism. So there's an interesting study. So in the journal Nutrition Biochemistry, there was a study, eight weeks biotin treatment. Okay, in this case, they found there was an increase in insulin receptor sensitivity, as well as an increase in the transcription factors for the expression of insulin uh, in general. So basically what this means is in order to produce insulin, you need things that produce insulin, insulin producing cells and whatnot. By taking in biotin, it increased the expression of what creates insulin. So hear this out. It also increased glucose tolerance, which means that subjects were able to suck up glucose into their cells better with no change in glucose. So what that means is Normally you'll see an improvement in glucose tolerance when glucose levels drop. Because if glucose levels drop, then the cells get a chance to refresh and they can become more sensitive to glucose. In this case, no change in glucose, but just adding in B7 ended up making the cells more sensitive to glucose. Uh, and then the study published in Medical Hypothesis did a review of type one diabetics and they found, or like a lot of papers of type one diabetics, that vitamin B7 increased the expression of what's called glucokinase and independent of insulin ultimately ended up improving glucose production in the liver. So basically, outside of insulin altogether, just adding B7 ended up improving glucose metabolism in general and insulin in type one diabetics. That's pretty wild. So by glucokinase, this can happen independent of insulin and type one diabetic, obviously not having insulin being produced. Oh, and before I get into B9, so we've got B7 sources here eggs, salmon, mushrooms, sweet potatoes, and avocado. So we've got some double whammies there, like mushrooms, avocado, uh, liver. These are all things that get both B7 and B5. B7 is best to get from the diet. You can take a supplement, of course, but the more that you can get it with other nutrients, the better the availability. Vitamin B9, folic acid, good for the brain. Again, you're gonna find it in prenatals for uh, brain development, but cognitive function even on aging people. We've got reductions in homocysteine, as well as reductions in amyloid beta 42, which up until recently was like the hallmark sign of Alzheimer's. However, it's still a risk factor. So with this, uh, the reactive oxygen species, the oxidative stress, as well as the plaque in the brain potentially gets reduced. Now, more evidence needs to kind of come out on that, but B9, very interesting there. 
Lastly, vitamin B12, we think of for energy because it's known for red blood cells, but what's really fascinating is we're seeing it with mood. Check this out. So the study published in Open Neurology Journal, they gave subjects an antidepressant or an antidepressant plus vitamin B12. 69% of the participants had a 20% reduction in depression via the Hamilton rating score if they were only on an antidepressant. 69% had a 20% improvement. 100% of people had a 20% or more improvement if they were on antidepressant plus B12. So what's interesting is B12 seems to work synergistically with antidepressants, and it's probably because it's needed mostly for that single carbon reaction, right? that basically that transaction that happens where a single carbon is essentially involved in basically transferring over for a neurotransmitter to be produced, like serotonin in this particular case in the monoamine neurotransmission. So with this, B12 might be one of the more powerful things you can take for the mood. And it's not just because it's lifting your energy, it's because it's actually helping that single carbon donation to allow a neurotransmitter like serotonin to be formed in the first place. So no wonder that works so well with like an SSRI where you're looking at improving the reuptake while also improving the actual creation of that neurotransmitter. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.